and it's <clears throat> oh yeah we forgot about the recording <laughs> it wasn't meant to be <laughs> um and and so it said the highest type of guru in order to convey instruction to persons of lower consciousness in this world they actually have to come down to a lower plane because on the highest plane of consciousness there isn't even perception of anything being wrong. There's no recognition of that. But in order to be able to instruct others, then you need to be able to at least discriminate between right and wrong, good and bad, right? So it's said that the what's known, what's referred to as the Uttam Adhikar Guru, the highest class of Guru, they, they have to descend to the middle class, Madhyam, position so that they can recognize the duality of the mundane world in order to give instruction to their disciples. But but on that highest level, they, you know, one does not even perceive that. One is simply seeing spirit is everywhere. Everyone is everyone is essentially spirit. And everything else is a just a fluffy superficial covering, not even worth taking note of. So anyhow, it's a, we had some discussion about this verse last week. I'll, for those who are, weren't here last week, we can, we can read that again. So this is verse 18 of chapter 5. The enlightened souls see transcendence within all living beings, whether the humble and learned Brahmin, the cow, the elephant, the dog, or the dog eater. Therefore, they are to be known as pundits, persons of true wisdom. So, you know, in the practice of bhakti, there, uh, when it comes to the spiritual plane, then there is some distinction, right? We, we in, the, in, the, in the line of, what I mean to say is in the line of bhakti, we don't believe that everything just ends in oneness, right? That beyond the beyond the plane of spiritual oneness, there is a plane of spiritual of um, variety, right? So there's the plane of material variety, material movement, dynamic movement, and variety. Then there's the the middle zone of of oneness, where everything merges into one consciousness, light. But then beyond that, there is again another plane of duality. <laughs> so there's a we recognize a material duality, but there's also a spiritual duality. And that's what in the school of bhakti, that is what we are interested in, right? So so some of these teachings of Bhagavad Gita, they, you know, they're they're dealing with kind of generic spiritual concepts which are applicable up to a point in the line of bhakti. So, for example, this verse is, is giving this, is encouraging this view of, of oneness, right? Which is helpful for those in the school of bhakti in the sense that we don't want to make distinction between what's good or bad on the material platform because it's all ultimately meaningless. You know, whether one is, you know, as it's mentioned, these well, these examples are quite Indian examples. <laughs> the Brahmin, the cow, the elephant, the dog, or the dog eater. These are very Indian examples. But <laughs> we can give some, some Western examples. You know? One is, a, let's say, one's the president, you know, or one is a, a street sweeper, or a bus driver, or a politician, you know, or a movie star, or works at McDonald's, you know, or a, a drug dealer, or a bum on the street. You know? or a philanthropist, right? You'll see ultimately these persons are all on the same plane. They're all dealing with material matter and they all have spirit. They are all spirit souls. So we don't want to make distinction on the material plane. We will see, from this angle, we will see a oneness that we are all spirit. And this, this, is, a, this is actually like a broad, a very broad and accommodating mood that is found in the in the Vedas, and our, it was something that our Gurudev spoke about, you know, in connection with the 
the famous Indian, um, what can we call him? Let's just call him a scholar for now. Vivekananda, um, you know, who's quite famous. He traveled to America in the 1800s. And he gave this famous talk, I think, at Chicago, is it Chicago University? And he began with this phrase, and it was such a famous and landmark talk. I believe they had it, they have it inscribed even today there in a public place in the university. Um, but he started out with this line, oh, my brothers and sisters of America, you know, which totally floored everyone and captured their hearts because. You know, this is this is not an Indian man coming to America in 2020. You know, this is in the 1800s. This would have been, you know, he would have he would have looked like an alien to them. It would have been something very, very different. You know, something very, very foreign. So they're all they're all like staring at this man. You're like, who is he? Somebody so removed from us in every way. You know, culture, appearance, nationality, all these things. And he starts out with this supremely unifying phrase, oh, my brothers and sisters of America. He completely captured his audience. You know? And our Gurudev commented about that, that um, you know, he, really, he really portrayed the spirit of the Vedic religion, you know? that we are all conscious beings. Shilasami Maharaj Prabhupada also spoke about this, you know, that people are... are you know, so many persons in the world today are eagerly working towards world peace. But this is the only way by which that can be achieved. If there is this acknowledgement and embracing of the fact that we are all spirit souls. This is the one unifying factor. You know, otherwise, there are so many things to divide us. right? Our personalities our appearances, our social backgrounds, our gender, the sexuality, all these things, education, social, social, economic, culture, like so many, we can come, we can sit and come up with thousands of things that separate us and divide us, right? But what is the one thing that unifies us? We are all spirit soul. We are all spirit soul. We are all children of God. So Swami Maharaj made this point that this is the only way we can achieve that. It is the greatest unifying factor, the greatest unifying factor that we all have in common. So there is an element of, of um, there is an aspect of, of oneness in that sense. But then entering deeper into the spiritual conception and the spiritual sky and deeper into our evolution on the spiritual side, then we will, we will, we will come more and more into a, an expression of spiritual diversity, yeah. unity in diversity. <laughs> Here's Naratam Prabhu also joining us, Sandavat, and I see Krishna Doyal Prabhu is also joining us, Sandavat. So, okay, well, we can continue with the, our reading of Bhagavad Gita unless anyone wants to add any thoughts at this point. Okay, we'll go on. So, um, so we can chant together verses um, 19 to 22. Vihaiva ter dita sargo Yesham sam yesitam manaha, Nirdosham hi samam brahma, Tasmad brahmani desitaha, Na prahishyat priyam prapya, No dvijat prapya chapriyam, Tira buddhira samudo, Brahma vir brahmani sitaha, Baya sparsheshva shaktatma, Vindat yatmani yatsukam, Sabrama yoga yuktatma sukha makshaya mashnute yehi samsparsha jaboga sukha yonaya evate adhyanta vanta kunteya nate shuramate budaha. Can White Prabhu, you want to read those verses for us, the translations? Verse number 19. 
Those whose minds are equiposed in Brahma have conquered the cycle of birth and death while living within this world. By their perfect spiritual equanimity, they are always situated in transcendence. Absorbed in transcendence, endowed with steady intelligence, and free from the delusion of thinking of the body and associated objects as me and mine, the knower of the absolute is neither happy when pleasant things come his way, nor sad when unpleasant things come, come his way. <clears throat> Detaching his mind from external pleasures, such a knower of the absolute truth tastes the inner joy of self-realization. Then, absorbing himself in meditation on the absolute, he experiences inexhaustible bliss. Just one more. Oh, is there? O oh, son of Kunti, the pleasures that arise from the contact of the senses with their objects are the cause of unhappiness, as they are transient. The wise never delight in such pleasures. Very nice. Sounds pretty good, huh? <laughs> I'd like to mention why Dave Prabhu stopped at experiencing inexhaustible bliss. My mind was just going there. I go, inexhaustible bliss. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and what through any any thought? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, oh, I'm just saying that's a sign me up. I'm that's partially why I'm here. I'm looking for the most blissful path and most authentic path. If there's something better, I'd be doing that. But here at the lotus feet of the te of the the teachings of Srila Bhakti Sundar Govinda Maharaj's lineage, I'm I'm happy. And <laughs> here. Krishna. Jai, jai. Yeah, that's the thing, right? We haven't we haven't found anything better, you know, and we don't think that we can. <laughs> There's one place where Shri Shidamar she he mentioned something like that. He he's speaking about he's going to, into some very high points. You know, regarding Vrindavan and the pastimes there, and 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 he says, and he says, as yet nothing more has been found. Like as yet nothing higher has been found. He says it like that in this in this funny way. Like as the as of yet, like nothing more has yet been found. You know, which is interesting because it you know it made me think like. You know, he's not following this in a in like this kind of dogmatic way like this is the way but you know he, it's like if someone can show me something better i'm open to that you know i'm not you know, i'm not a blind follower but i'm following this because this is what i can understand to be the most superior thing available but if somebody can show me something more i'm i'm open to that you know? but he's saying no one has come up with no one else has found anything more <laughs> so we you know we don't want to be these like blind dogmatic followers you know, like this is the only way nothing else and we're ready to kill people for it right and so on and so forth you know? but according to our knowledge so far with with an open mind we've made some comparative analysis we found this to be the sweetest and highest and most developed conception but if somebody can show us something more, then we're open to that. You know, we are unbiased. We're not prejudiced people. Vishakha okay. <laughs> Didi, um, yes, may, I, may I please ask a question? Um, uh, and on uh, uh, this regard, in terms of like the, um, uh, the, the Bhagavad Gita as uh, was read by Srila Prabhupada versus um, the Bhagavad Gita we have here. Um, uh, now I'm not. I'm, I'm, I know both are bona fide in the sense of like, uh, is there a reason why we're uh, like we we using one over the other, or like are both? Can we read from both of them, etc.? Oh, sorry. Read from what? Sorry, both. The Bhagavad Gita. Um, the Bhagavad Gita as it is, as was written by Shri Prabhupada. Uh, oh, versus the yeah. one we're using here. I just wanted to ask that a question, like in the sense, um, you know, those are both coming from our from our chariots. So mm -hmm. I want to know, like, um, 
and the disciple of succession. So can we read from Shri Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita as, as well, um, is my question. I mean, I, I say definitely. I would say I would yeah. say it's a good idea. I would say it's yeah, a good yeah, yeah. idea. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And okay. and I I and um and I think especially for persons who are coming to Krishna consciousness for the first time, it's a really good idea to read because yeah. I don't know if this is offensive to say, but you know, this edition it's it's kind of like a little snobby in the sense that it doesn't deal with the abcs you know it yeah, doesn't, yeah, 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 yeah. It doesn't yeah. this this edition of bhagavad gita doesn't go into the basics um gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. whereas in shila swami Maharaj prabhupada's edition he he goes into he goes into the the beginner um yeah. matters and so I think it's definitely a good idea to, to read that book. I mean, to read that edition of Bhagavad Gita. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, our, our, our edition of Bhagavad Gita is very concise. You know? and, and actually, it requires some careful reading. A lot, of, a lot of the commentary is kind of there in a hidden way, like, for example, in some of the word for word. Um, and then there are a few carefully chosen purports on on matters of significant of like particular significance um and especially of special note is the commentary on the chatur shloki what are known as the, the you you know these things yeah. the four principal verses of bhagavad gita in chapter 10 um then there's also an explanation given on 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 the on some tr tricky points that are discussed in the ninth chapter. Um, and then there are a few earlier on, like one or two, two others, two or three perhaps in earlier chapters. Um, so it's very concise and it's only, you know, it's only dealing with um, very particular, like outstanding points. Yes, um, I so, understand. Yeah. So, I, so I think it's definitely a good idea to, um, good. to go through. Good. Swami Maharaj Prabhupada's edition for sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for explaining that. Yeah, that, that was that was um one, I guess, issue of con not of contention, but it just something I was thinking of and I didn't know how to address. So thanks. Okay. <laughs> Didi. Yeah, yes, Prabhu. Please. Uh Pushta Krishna Prabhu used to Pushta Krishna Prabhu, if you don't know, he was a longtime devotee. He was with Prabhupada, he was his secretary of Srila Prabhupada and then he came to Guru Maharaj and Guru Vinda Maharaj and he would give Bhagavad Gita class at the the temple here and he would read both uh mm -hmm. Shri Swami Maharaj's and Srila Sridhar Maharaj's and the comment he made one time is, is that Srila Sridhar Maharaj every translation is a purport like that mm -hmm. that's how like fine that his translation was that like he was giving his purport in the translation Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That that's a very comment. nice point that's a very nice comment and you know actually one thing on my list and by the way Dandavat Jayadev you've also been with us and I you noted your had some nice comments in our chat um, but you know one, one, one project for the future you know we have a Bengali Gita See, this English one has been made based on our Bengali edition. However, there are some things in our Bengali edition which are missing in the English. This is what I've come to be aware of, um, particularly in the word for word. I, I noted it because Gurudev mentioned, he quoted something from the word for word of the Bengali edition. And I checked in the English, it wasn't in the English one. So... That is a project for the future. But then on the other hand, our Bengali Gita doesn't have some of the purports that are in the English edition. Um, so, so yeah, but it would be nice to, to have a new, a new edition one day, which includes these special word for words that are in the Bengali one. So, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think the reason I'm I I, I like to just focus on this is because I'm I'm someone who when I go into something, I like to give it 100 percent attention. You know, some of the speakers in our mission, they they have a custom, of, for example, they have a custom of giving class where they read, you know, like 20 minutes from this book and 20 minutes from that book and maybe even a third book, another 20 minutes. Um, but I I that doesn't work well for me because once I go into something, I like to fully absorb. Um, so like I couldn't do, like if I'm going in Chaitanya Charjamita, like then to shift out of that into another book, that's very difficult. Because when I'm going into Chaitanya Charjamita, or if I'm going into Bhagavad Gita, or if I'm going into Prabhupada Jivanamrita, or if I'm going into one of our Guru's books, then it's like, I'm fully immersing myself in that. And then I can't like just transition immediately to another book. So, so also for me, I would find it difficult to go back and forth between, you know, this edition and then Swami Maharaj's edition. And, you know, it would, it would be difficult. I like it when I'm absorbing myself in this book, I like to just fully immerse myself. So that's, that's just my personal preference. I don't mean any disrespect to Shula Swami Maharaj Prabhupada's edition. Absolutely not. Um, and, it, you know, in fact, we could even mention it as helpful preparatory reading, you know, before, beforehand. Um, so, so, yeah. So One I share that's... I have is that I read and distributed to the Swami Maharaj Prabhupada's Bhagavad Gita many times. Um, and so this specific class was I'd never gone through the hidden treasure. Of the, I really wanted to go through Sri Shri Shri Maharaj's Bhagavad Gita for myself. And I wanted to do that in the understanding of the parampara because I'm quite new to this, you know, understanding of the, the this higher teaching of bhakti is I've, I've very been grateful for Vishak and Didi's, um, I call her my spiritual mentor to uh, outside when I introduced her. <laughs> so I appreciate her presentation on, on bhakti. It's very sweet. And I feel very, this is like, when well, is our bona fide Bhagavad Gita study in the lineage? <laughs> Thanks everyone for joining us. Mm -hmm. Oh, Chintamani, beautiful. Welcome, Ananda Krishna Prabhu has just joined us. All right. Um, any other any other comments or questions from anyone, or should we continue? Okay. Um, oh, so that's right. We just went through these verses here, and we were we were all feeling that we want to sign up for this inexhaustible bliss that's being spoken of. <laughs> um, anyone want to make any chinmoy Prabhu? Do you want to share any thoughts on those verses? Anybody else? Well, I think I'd just like to mention that inexhaustible bliss is actually just kind of the beginning. <laughs> yeah because it, it, he's going to go into bhakti i think this is more on like meditation on the absolute paramatma but i think we're actually going to get higher than inexhaustible bliss <laughs> very good point very good point <laughs> This is mentioned in, in the first verse of the Shikshashtakam, the um, prayers of Lord Chaitanya Dev. And, and it's mentioned, Anandam Budi Vardhanam, you know, an ever increasing ocean of joy. Then Pratipadam Purnamrita Svadhanam. You know, at, at every at every step, you know, one will experience the taste of full nectar. And Shilashita Maharaj, he, he mentions in regards to that, he's in um in I think it's loving search for the lost servant. He he says he says it is fresh joy, you know, not the stale joy that we may experience in this world. <laughs> He speaks of stale, stale joy and living fresh joy. <laughs> so 
So yeah, some interesting points here, um, significant points. Firstly, it's mentioned here that such a state can be attained even while living in this world, <laughs> even while physically entrenched in this world and everything that comes along with it. Internally, one may be connecting to this higher plane and may be perceiving their environment with this transcendental vision. So we should not think we are limited simply because we have these gross, fleshy encasements. But everything is consciousness, as Shulashita Marsh would emphasize. Everything is existing within consciousness. So material consciousness, spiritual consciousness, our physical location is not a factor there. But where are we directing our consciousness? And sometimes it is astonishing to experience how dramatically our consciousness can shift, right? You know, I'm sure we've all had moments like that where one moment we're like on the verge of death. <laughs> like It's all over. You know, the world's going to end. <laughs> it can't get worse. So I'm all alone. <laughs> nothing's worth living for. And it may be even a few moments later where this dramatic shift takes place. We're on top of the world. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, in specifically in, you know, in reference to the material and spiritual side, we may experience, right, dramatic difference. One moment we may feel overcome by our material nature, lust, anger, greed, delusion, madness, all these things. And the next moment, we may be feeling on a very high high platform, may feel like we're floating in the clouds and feel very, very removed from the conception of matter. What is matter? Matter is something so far away. What is this gross physical world that is so far away? It can be astonishing how dramatically these shifts can take place. And then, you know, that acts as a reminder for us, you know, in the future, when we start to get dragged down again by that lower energy, we can try and remind ourselves, oh, I know this isn't a be all and end all. I'm not going to make any decisions in this state of mind. <laughs> I'm not going to sign up for anything in this state of mind. But I have to wait, wait for that lower wave to pass, you know, wait for it to pass. So, that's our condition at present, right? Going between this side and that side. And sometimes all we can do is just patiently bear these things out, right? And keep trying to align ourselves with our spiritual goals and spiritual teachings. We're trying to view the environment with our our spiritual... What was that phrase that you used, Anandu Krishna? It was very nice, the, the Maya detector. <laughs> my detector glasses or something like that it was very nice <laughs> yeah i think it was uh something like my the, the lenses the lenses will will soon like appear or something like that throughout yeah, time you kind of like acquire my... these new lenses yeah mm -hmm. yeah yeah <laughs> exactly exactly so we, when we go to view the environment we want to try to put these glasses on the environment and through through the through the lens of spiritual teachings not through what our gross eyes are telling us and our gross physical senses are telling us but but what is because our calculation is very limited just like if a little insect if a little ant comes into this into our space that ant has very limited faculties to understand what is going on in the immediate environment the ant is able to connect with the physical happenings, the physical sensation and experience, but has no capacity to comprehend, you know, who is this, this person in front of me? What is their ideal? What is their aspiration in life? And what are all these fine, sophisticated things going on? That insect doesn't have that comprehension. So we also 
our ability to perceive that which is of a higher, more subtle nature than ourselves, we, we, we don't have entrance there. We don't have perception there. There are faculties, our mundane faculties have no entrance there. We don't have the right senses, just like dogs have a higher range of hearing than ourselves. So, so many animals have, have, uh, have can see and hear things that we cannot. So in the same way, when it comes to things of a spiritual nature, we cannot rely on our own senses. So therefore we have to go to those persons who do have that vision, who have had that higher experience. You know, what has been recorded of their experience and their vision. And then we have to follow that. And in that sense, there is an element of blindness at times, right? We, we're not interested in blind faith, but and when it comes to certain points, we can theoretically understand the teachings, but when it comes to application, sometimes we have to follow a little blindly because we're not, we're not able to perceive that higher plane at present. Just like if a doctor tells you, if you eat this chocolate cake, it's going to be bad for you. you know, but if you eat this green salad, it'll be good for you. And, when, and we don't have, in the, in the moment, that doesn't like, in terms of our own experience, that doesn't mean anything to us. We know if we eat the chocolate cake, it's very enjoyable. And if we eat the, the bitter salad, it may not be very enjoyable, right? So, but the doctor is telling us, I can tell you if you eat this, it's going to be bad for you and you're, it's going to damage your health. And if you eat this, it's going to be good for you. So in that sense, we have to little, be a little blind in how we follow that because we know the scientists, they know how it works. And they're giving us the, the practical advice, how we can get the results that we want. So in the same way, there are spiritual scientists you know, who can perceive that higher plane, who understand the workings of that higher plane. And then they're, they're giving us in a, in, a, in a simple and accessible, practical way, the path by which we can reach that, we can attain that. So, so we're fortunate, right? That we were able to follow in the footsteps of these spiritual experts you know, who have that spiritual science. They've walked the path and now they can show us that that way. And welcome, Eva. We're happy to have you in the group. <laughs> May I add a comment? Um, please, please. Finish, finish. So uh, this uh, Radhashtami was just celebrated recently. And um, during that time, I uh, remembered um, Lord Shiva in the sense of his uh, example of being Dita, like very steady and and focused and uh, in, Krishna, in Krishna consciousness, and and that's very inspiring to me and, and to like help. Like he's one of the twelve Mahajans. So um, in the way of like uh, you know learning from him how to be more Krishna conscious and and to be steady in, in our and our bhakti is it helps me a lot and in, in, in my advancement and um no i'm not saying advanced at all but i'm just saying like you know like hel helping me align my myself and my senses in, in a way that i can um you know approach krishna consciousness in a more uh wholesome and sattvic way so uh, I just wanted to make that comment that, you know, the steadiness that, that Lira um, really helps in, in that dedication and, um, and especially to engage the senses in, in the service of Krishna, so that, that'll help. So I just wanted to make that comment. I hope that helps. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you for sharing, Narutam. Yes, this type of steadiness is being referred to here and something certainly to be aspired for and then in this next verse you know it is mentioned the knower of the absolute is neither happy when pleasant things come his way nor sad when unpleasant things come right so these things are all are all operating on the superficial plane right the sense objects are engaging with the senses 
and so on. The mental plane is engaging with those of mental, those things of mental interest. The intellect is engaging with those things of intellectual interest. You know, and those things may be considered happy, sad, good, bad, right? But that's all on the plane of mundane duality. So one who is living in the consciousness of that I am Atma, I, I am soul, they see very clearly these things are just, you know, they're, they, they don't have any significance. They don't have any importance. It is like, um, what's that word? Receptors, right? Like receptors are built to engage with different types of stimuli, right? And so there's mental, there's sensory stimuli, there's mental stimuli, there's intellectual stimuli. And naturally those things, and naturally the, the mind will be, attract, will be engaged by mental stimuli, the senses will be engaged by sensory stimuli and so on. That's, how, that's what they're built for. So they're very busy there. But person, th that, that person who is awake in the plane of soul, of spirit, they can see these things are all playing out on the surface, but nothing really to do with me, actually. Nothing really to do with me. And there's a verse at the beginning of Srimad Bhagavatam, which our Gurudev likes very much. Shotavya dini rajanja nirnam shanti sahasrasa. Atma napasha. I can't remember the second line, but it's saying that those persons who are blind to the needs of the soul they find many things to see and to hear and to speak about in this world. You know, they're very busy in the plane of the senses. They're very busy and very active in the plane of the senses. But if they are awake in the plane of soul, then all these things, they're, there's, you know, there's nothing to talk about. <laughs> you know, there's nothing to see. You know, whereas we, you know, we go out in the world and it's like there's a circus for the senses. You know, it's, there's so many things, you know, so many channels to watch, you know, so many potato chips to buy, <laughs> you know, so on and so forth. So many interesting things, you know, captivating things. There's too much. I don't have enough time to enjoy all the things to be seen and to be heard and to be tasted and to be spoken about. I'll go mad because I, you know, my, I can't keep up with it all, right? But for the person who's awake in the plain, of transcendence, there it's all a void. Shanyayate, you know? Mahaprabhu, right? Shanyayate Jagat Sarvam Govinda Virahename. In the absence of my beloved Govinda, there is nothing here. It is all empty. It is all a void. So not, not that we're going to, as you were saying at the beginning, not that we are denying beauty, variety, dynamic movement, pleasure, enjoyment. We're not denying those things, but we don't want to seek them in this lower plane that's built on temporality. You know, it, is, it is like we're building sandcastles in this world. We're building a house of cards. You know, seeking material pursuits, material enjoyment is like that. So there's no firm foundation. Eventually, it, it's all going to fizzle out. It's all going to crash down. It's all going to fizzle into nothing. There's no firm foundation there. It's all built on temporary ideas that have temporary results. There's no permanence there. There's no, there's no permanent truth, no permanent existence, no permanent meaning there. So as we were saying also at the beginning, this inexhaustible, we're not denying, right, bliss. You know, we want bliss more than anyone. <laughs> but we want inexhaustible bliss, not, not five-minute bliss. <laughs> we don't want 10-minute bliss. We want never ending, ever increasing, anandam buddhi vardhanam, ever increasing. 
joy, ever fresh joy, never ending joy. You want that type of joy. So we're gonna we're going in for the long term investment. <laughs> Not interested in you know instant instant results, instant noodles, microwave food. <laughs> We don't want fast food. We want slow food. <laughs> mm -hmm. Welcome to angels also joined us. And Krishna Goyal Prabhu is busy in the SoCal kitchen. Happy to see you, Prabhu. Prabhu. <laughs> and the Vat holding down the fort. The yeah, kitchen. I'm just listening to you guys. I'm doing my seva. I'm I don't get that much chance to listen to you, but uh, whenever I get this quiet here, so I can listen to you quietly. Very happy, very happy, very beautiful. Mm -hmm. Very nice to have you with us, Guru. Hare Krishna. Okay, well, um, what else here? The body and associated objects as me and mine. This is really the root of it all, isn't it? The root of all suffering. Me and I, me and mine. Is the root of our problems. Didi, I, I just like to mention, you, you, you mentioned it of course, but like it specifically mentioned that, the, that this, we're not to feel sad or, or happy is is on the material plane. I, I I always really need to for me it's helpful to make that distinction that like it's it's not like we're going to be robots that we are going to feel joy and happiness and and sadness and all other things but on the transcendental plane which is much different than the material plane. Mm. Yes, thanks for picking that point up, Prabhu. Yes, it, it's very funny, isn't it? It's kind of like the rules all change at a certain point. <laughs> there's there's one set of rules up to here. Then it's like, okay, throw that all out. Now rethink, rethink everything. You know, Sometimes in school, it may be like that, right? Okay, up to class five, you've been taught this. And then it's like, okay, now everything's going to change. You know, it's, all out, it's all out the window now. Now we have to enter into a more refined understanding. So yes, <clears throat> that is right. And really the main point here is that the main problem is that our, our happiness, sadness, our pursuits, they're based on selfish interest, right? So we want to become indifferent to that plane, the plane of selfish interest and mundanity and all such things of the temporary plane, illusory plane. But then we want to become reacquainted with another, we want to become acquainted with a, another interest, a higher interest. We want to become acquainted with, with making Krishna happy, with making the Lord happy, with making the devotees of Krishna happy, the friends of Krishna happy. And that is a whole different ball game. So then our happiness and sadness will no longer be based upon our own interest, our own needs and all these things, our own loss and gain, our own benefit. But it will be conceived in connection, in the connection of our loving Lord. That will be what makes us happy or sad. How can I please my beloved? How can I please my beloved Lord? Everything will be centered around that. And then there may also be anger also. It is all in connection with the higher interest. So it is, it is of a different nature. And Shila Shudamaraj in one place, he, he refers to it actually as a type of spiritual laziness to want to jumble everything into one. 
<laughs> that you know we can't find a solution to the complexities of life. And so we just want to jumble it all into one. Everything's one. We cannot find a solution to enjoyment, right? We have the we because we see that the spirit of enjoyment gets us into trouble. So throw it all away, give it all up. That's the easiest thing to do, right? Sometimes our renunciation can be like that, right? And oh, it's all just too complicated to deal with. I just want to give it all up and live in a cave, right? It's a type of laziness, actually. <laughs> but let's, you know, let's really try to try to come to some finer idea. We don't need to jumble everything together. Let us try to appreciate you know, distinction on the spiritual plane, gradation on the spiritual plane. Let's try to enter into some nuanced understanding, some refined understanding. I would like to, I don't know if I can find it right now. It's a very nice article, Sri Dhammash. Let me see if I can, maybe I can find it quickly. Just looking for unity and diversity. Maybe this is the article. Let's see. Diversity or, or opposition has its position, a real position. Consider the branches of a tree. Every branch wants to draw more juice from the trunk. Still, they also help each other in many cases. So unity and diversity is present in nature itself. We are to study how it is useful to us. There is competition in our organic body. The brain uses one eighth of all the blood in the body. <laughs> such a small amount of mass wants so much food, and such an amount of blood is not shared with any other parts of the body. Without devotees, the Lord cannot go on. Without a son, a father is not conceivable. For there to be generous persons, there must be someone who needs to be shown generosity. Generosity requires for its own existence that there is someone upon whom pity should be taken. So everything has a relative position. Everything depends on another thing for its own existence. No, this isn't the article I was seeing here, but it's related to this idea of unity and diversity and appreciating diversity within divinity, variety within divinity, relativity even within divinity. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think I found it here, this article. It's called The Dynamic Whole. Why must the original thing be static? I don't think this is exactly what I was thinking, but this is also nice. Does Advaita, non-duality, mean that we are in an organic whole or in a non-differentiated whole? So this idea of Advaita, oneness, it has its place, right? That there is a oneness. But what is the nature of that oneness? Is, it, is there a dynamic nature to it? Is it an organic whole comprised of different parts? Or, it is, or is it non-differentiated in the sense that there's no variety, there's no diversity? The whole, Advaita, Advaya Jnan, non-dual knowledge, is admitted by all spiritual thinking men. But what is the proper conception of Advaita? Do other things remain within it? Or does everything vanish into a non-differentiated oneness? If everything vanishes, then how has everything sprung up from that position? 
So this is a really interesting point, you know, because Shula Shudamaraj is saying that, you know, we live within a plane of diversity. So how is it that this diverse and dynamic world has its, its origin, this static, non-differentiated plane of non-variety? How has variety come from non-variety? Especially when, if you consider it, diversity is of a more sophisticated nature than oneness. So then how is it that a less sophisticated thing can produce a more sophisticated thing? The concept of such non-differentiated oneness is just like that of the fossil, the spiritual fossil, we may say. Why can't we admit that an organic coal can be eternal? Why can only non-differentiated static be eternal? Why shouldn't Advaita be something dynamic? Why shouldn't the eternal substance be a cosmos, a harmonized whole? Our conception of Advaita, oneness, should be that of an organism, an organic whole, a dynamic harmony. Otherwise, we are forced to think that the dynamic has sprung from the static, that a static state is the origin. If that is so, then where does motion come from? And if the static is not conscious, then where does consciousness come from? Whether we conceive of our origin as a fossil or as Brahma, non-differentiated spirit, we face the same difficulty. Why must things of lower nature be able to produce things of higher nature? From, equilibri from equilibrium movement comes, why can't movement be eternal? We find that in the sky, nothing can remain static. Everything is moving. Recently, this satellite Sputnik was sent into space, and what have we found? That it is always moving, that it is difficult to make it stay fixed in one position. So we see that dynamic character is natural even outside the earth. Dynamic character should be seen as the eternal thing, the basis of everything. And the static should be understood as a diseased condition, a paralyzed condition of the dynamic. The dynamic is the original and the static is artificial. That is the basis of Vaishnava Dharma. Why must the original, I'll just read this last paragraph. I know we're running out of time. Why must the original thing be static and of the very lowest order? And why must whatever good or higher things that exist have, have to have sprung up from that fossil? That is a bad mentality. The revealed truth has always said, there is God. He said, let there be water, let there be light. And there was light and there was water. In this way, the truth expresses itself. By his order, things come into existence. It is not that a lower thing is producing God, a fossil is producing God. Rather, God is producing the fossil. Very nice and very reasonable. It is very reasonable. <laughs> All right, we're out of time. Any any last words from, from anyone before we close for today? In time, any, any last words? It's just letting that all soak in the 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 healing. It's the, the this whole hearing this teaching is is healing the the thought patterns that are of this world, and we're getting this higher taste. This opportunity. This is a great opportunity. This weekly. Bhagavad Gita study with you, we get this opportunity to really heal ourselves, I'm feeling. Yeah, thank you, Didi. That was very beautifully expressed in time. They love that. Healing the thought patterns in this world. Very nice. <laughs> well, Ganga Leela, do you want to pray us out for today? Please. I pass it on to Chintamani. She's on a roll. I feel, I, I don't know, I'm speechless <laughs> i love it when you say that Gagalina. whatever you say that i think i think wow then it must have been good <laughs> you know you know you know there's this one um there's this one prayer it's a well-known prayer uh that by the grace of guru a dumb man can speak and a lame person can 
across mountains, right? <laughs> but Shil but Shilashidamar, she, you know, Shilashidamar always has this way of looking at things in a fresh way. And he and he renders that verse in a different way. And he says that that actually it is that when we face divinity for real, then we will become dumb. We won't be able to we will become speechless. We won't be able to we won't be able to say anything. When we touch the current, we'll become speechless. You know? So but then by the grace of, of Guru, then we may be able to say something. <laughs> So, Hi, Krishna. so I, 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 I always I always am happy when you say that because I think yes that's that's actually the real feeling when we're really contacting these teachings that's really how we should feel like what can we say what can we say yeah and I noticed that my focus was so well I, I was absorbing it from somewhere where I needed it more not my intellect because my intellect tends to narrate and then I can speak well and then I can you know come up with words but I was really in in, in a heart, more heartfelt space so thank you and also really just in that heartfelt felt space I really feel the presence of of everyone here it's so beautiful to see all these smiling faces <laughs> Like really, and you know, cooking in the ashram is going on, and it's just, uh, yeah, it means a lot. It's 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 more than just listening to words. Thank you for that space, Hare Krishna. Shall we chant three Mahamantras together and unmute if we can and want to? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. See you all next week. See ya. See you. Adiós.